early on it was okay because like very early on i mean like maybe the first year or so just because we were building a product like that was the part that i knew and loved trying to sell like it was all about organized chaos in every single possible way that you can have it where it started to get more difficult is when we raised that first bit of money and it was almost like all of a sudden it became real the doubts in my head about my ability to do this just like kept getting worse and worse as we got as we just kept growing we raised our a round and then ahead of our sort of first us funding round we had the opportunity to we had an awesome experienced sales leader and i wholeheartedly thought that i was not the right person to be leading the business i thought i don't know enough you know people don't want to you know come and work with me and you know there needs to be a real adult at the table uh and so made the decision to have someone else come in and lead the business yeah a leadership a leadership team started to get formed um while they were here and that the impact on me and the business was actually even worse Hi everyone, I'm your host Rohit Bhargava and you are listening to episode 160 of the Startup Playbook podcast, a weekly podcast series where I sit down with successful tech founders, investors and operators to unpack their journey, lessons and insights to help current and future entrepreneurs. The voice that you heard a little bit earlier was that of Sam Crowther, the co-founder and CEO of Casada and our guest for this episode. If you've ever founded a startup, you know that the journey is never straightforward. In this episode, not only do we talk about some of the highs of Sam's journey, namely launching Casada as a 19 year old, building a company that's used by many Fortune 50 companies and having raised over $39 billion in funding from the likes of Reinventure, Our Innovation Fund and Malcolm Turnbull, the former Prime Minister of Australia. But Sam also shares some of the lows, particularly the period that led him questioning his own abilities that ultimately led to him stepping down as CEO. Thankfully, it didn't take long for Sam to see the detrimental effects that him stepping back from the role had on the company, and he was soon reinstated back as the CEO of Casada. In this interview, we covered a range of topics, including the customer insights that led to the pivot from Sam's first business, Useek, into what is now Casada, how Sam landed Sportsbet as the very first customer and their approach to enterprise sales, how Sam was able to raise capital from the likes of Malcolm Turnbull, and the structures that Sam has put into place since returning as CEO that has made him a better and more confident leader and much more. Speaking of structures, it is so important to have the right internal and external structures in place when launching your business. And that's why I'm excited to partner with LawPath. LawPath's legal advice plan gives you access to lawyers on demand for one low monthly fee. Through their platform, you can create documents, sign online, and even have a lawyer on call to help with any legal issues. They've helped save Australian businesses over $100 million in legal fees and are offering our community 20% off their most popular plan. To get access to this offer, head over to lawpath.com slash playbook. That's L-A-W-P-A-T-H dot com slash playbook. As you will hear, one of the recurring themes through this podcast is the importance of having the right team around you. And I know how hard that can be at the early stages, particularly when you're a non-technical founder and don't have the right tech team around you. And that's why I'm excited to partner with Dovetail Studios. Dovetail Studios operates a venture studio and a VC fund to turn ambitious ideas into unstoppable businesses. Not only are they a renowned product development partner for startups like Afterpay, but through their VC fund, they also invest in early stage companies that go through their venture studio program. So if you're a non-technical early stage founder looking for a talented team to supercharge your success, head over to dovetailstudios.com. As you're getting more and more successful, you need someone to help you manage your finances. And the best in the business are the team at Sender. I run all of my personal and business accounting through them and can say from first-hand experience that Gareth, Charlotte and the team at Sender are more than just an accounting firm. They have a dedicated focus for founders, funders, and startups, and can help you with everything from balancing your books and managing your tax to helping with your exit strategy. To find out more, head over to sender.com. That's S-C-E-N-D-A-R.com. With that out of the way, and without further ado, here is my interview with Sam Crowther. Hi, Sam. Welcome to the Startup Playbook podcast, and thanks so much for taking the time to be on the show today. Appreciate it. Awesome to be here and thanks for the invite, Rohit. Likewise, I know it's taken us a little while to, to get here, but very, very glad that we can finally make this episode happen, Sam. 
Sam, for those people that maybe are not as familiar with you or your background, do you want to share a little bit about your story and what got you here today? Awesome. Yeah, so my name's uh, Sam Crowther, the founder of a security business called Casada. Uh, and your, my, my personal background has been breaking things, uh, working you know, in security, you know, maybe doing some things before I started working in it officially, uh, and you know, pulling things apart, trying to understand them, and you know, all of a sudden realized it's actually very interesting to solve the problems, not just cause them when you break them. And so I uh, you know, ended up leaving a job at, at Macquarie Bank to, to build a business to, you know, to help others uh, instead of just telling them where all their problems were. <laughs> um, I, I love that little analogy. I actually have a story from someone that I spoke to um, in doing research for this interview, Tyrone, who I believe was one of your best friends growing up. He mentioned that both of you tried to burn down a school. We, yes, we did. We liked experimenting. We liked to see what we could do. And, and there was, a, I remember it very well, a wooden ruler. We, fit, we, we discovered friction together. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, well, Sam, I mean, you know, I, I know that you've kind of uh, glossed over a little bit about, you know, everything that you sort of achieved to date, but I think it's just, you know, an absolutely fascinating story. I think you were about 19 years old when you, when you launched Casada. Um, yep, can you, right. you know, sort of take us through the journey of, of what that was like in terms of, uh, you know, leaving high school and sort of deciding, you know, what would essentially become Casada? Yeah. So look, I, was very fortunate that after, as I graduated high school, I got an offer from Macquarie Group to come and join their security team, which they were assembling, particularly as they made the transition to be a retail bank. They realized they needed more people there. And I was, I was brought on to break stuff and, you know, sort of cause a bit of mayhem uh, and just kept seeing a lot of the same problems. And, and, you know, I always love tinkering around and building things in my spare time. So I ended up designing... Uh, what I thought could be a solution to some of the problems that they were seeing. And I think it was yeah, someone, someone mentioned, you know, maybe this is something you should turn into a business. Like maybe this is, you know, broader than, than where you're at now. And uh, as, as it always seems to happen, you know, through a friend of a friend of a friend, found someone with, you know, 50 grand who said, all right, if you can put together a small team, build us a prototype, We'll give you 50 grand to do that. And then we'll give you another 50 grand at the end of it to uh, you know, see if we can get a customer or two on it. And look, so more than anything, I think it was a, a lot of naivety. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. I just knew it was kind of fun to, to solve this, pro kind of fun, sorry, to solve these problems and figured I had nothing to lose. Uh, you know, no mortgage, no family to support or anything. And yeah, so jump right in and then realized what I'd gotten myself into. And I'm still realizing it, you know, every, every few months there's a new, uh, yeah, a new corner we turn and it's like, holy crap. All right, let's, let's figure out how we solve this one. For anyone that's kind of been through that journey, it, it's kind of understanding that it's not necessarily a linear path. There is a lot of, you know, almost a process that you need to go through to even understand what it is that you're sort of building. And uh, again, from what I understand, you know, Casada wasn't the original sort of idea that you wanted to launch with. The first business was USIC, <laughs> I believe. Yep. So again, for the benefit of, of the listeners, do you want to share a little bit about what um, USIC was and I guess the, the journey into pivoting into Casada? Yeah, so USIC, the, the idea behind this was to get rid of passwords with something much stronger and simpler. And so we, we built something that used like photographs on your phone. So literally, like instead of entering a password, you'd choose a photo from your camera roll and that'd be used as a, as a private key to authenticate you. And that sort of came from like a lot of the problems we're seeing are around account security, right? We're trying to make, first of all, it easier to, to log in and then also far easier to be more secure. And there was like one tiny specific part of that product which caught a few people's interest and that was what we do today, right? Which is what became Casada. And the piece of, the one little piece of this product actually had far more application than the rest of it. And so like, I, you know, over the space of a few weeks, we built a prototype where we fleshed that little sub feature out into a full new product and the reception it got was far better. And so we just made the decision, no more work on the other one. Like we need to, we need to change what we're doing. And that was the best damn decision ever. I think it was actually a prospect for our first product that said that they would be more interested in buying the, the little one component of it than the rest of it. Sometimes I can take a really long process to kind of understand where you know, customers are really seeing that value. And it's, you know, as you mentioned, really helpful if a, if a, a potential customer or a prospect actually points that out to you. But how long were you running USIG for before you sort of realized that the actual opportunity was in, you know, what is now Casada? Yeah, so we, 
early 2016 is when we started building the what is Casada now. So I want to say about a year. So like there was just Tyrone and a, a few others we were a very tiny team for yeah for the first like 12 months that we're building this USIG product and as part of it this like one little tiny feature yeah and and we're just we're very fortunate we got the feedback early enough before we gone too far down the route where we realized okay we we need to we need to pivot immediately we've both mentioned Tyrone who was one of your first employees at uh USIG and, and Casada we kind of briefly mentioned that both of you were very close friends growing up. Uh, yep. I believe that you actually lost contact with each other for a number of years before you kind of sent him a, a Facebook friend invite. Um, and then you sort of reached out to him about a job. And I think he, he said that, you know, oh, this sounds really interesting, but like I'm looking for a full-time gig and uh, yeah. those sort of oh. things. Yeah, he was yeah. convinced it was a scam. And then I was like, mate, we'll pay you. And he's like, oh, I'll twist my arm, twist my arm. <laughs> Again, like it, it's it's something that's kind of often overlooked. You know, everyone sort of, uh, you know, talks about the co-founding journey. I think, um, you know, there's less uh, conversation around, you know, what is it like in terms of bringing the first few people on board and, and getting people to, to, you know, really believe you and kind of join you on the journey when you don't necessarily have a lot of the, the proof points around you or the funding or, or kind of the customer base. What did that look like in terms of, you know, bringing Tyrone and some of the early other team members on board? Yeah, it, it was very difficult, right? And you know, hiring in the very early days is, is extraordinarily difficult. I, it, was, it was truly, and I guess this is the nature, like the personality of the sort of person that will be attracted to a business at that stage. You know, we, we got, you know, we had to get excited about like what it, is we're trying to do and then also just people who are excited about creating stuff like that's tyrone jono and and some of the mac the other early guys all just love building things from scratch and we're all super young as well which like i will admit absolutely helped because it, you know if it had failed it wouldn't have really mattered like it wouldn't have had an impact on us like we just would have gone and gotten real jobs as we were told to do um yeah but where i found I guess, you know, Tyrone, what we found, the, the other first few employees all were just like friends of friends. Um, they either like work together, gone to uni together, but we're all still in that rough cohort. And that's probably where our first like six or seven people came from is, is mates of mates who'd either been in and around the startup world or gone to uni together and, and had just had a lot of trust in the person who was bringing them in. That's, yeah, that, that's, that's what I summarize as how we got the first, the first few folk on board. Yeah, and I guess, you know, even with, in my conversation with Tyrone, he mentioned that it was about a year or so between kind of the first conversation that he had with you um, to, to when he sort of eventually jumped yep. on board. Do you have any advice for anyone who is potentially in that position where they're, you know, talking to friends of friends or, or has a couple of people um, that they're speaking to in terms of how do you, uh, you know, help get people across the line in terms of wanting to, to fully sort of commit and join your company? Yeah, I, I think what... What helped me at least was that I was very hell bent on doing it and, and I, I truly love this stuff so much and I do it a lot and, and, and happily do it. And I think me being so obsessed with it definitely helped. Uh, but then also, you know, and I guess this comes back to the problem you're solving, like making sure that it's, it's going to resonate with the folk that you're, you're trying to bring on board um, is, is super important as well. And that's like it did with Tyrone, with Mac and, and all the other people that were very early on is like, it was a problem they actually wanted to solve. And so making sure it's like, it's pitched in a way or talked about in a way where they can see the impact it would either have on them personally, if, you know, if it grew uh, or people, people they know. Yeah. And, you know, obviously we've kind of spoken about it from a perspective of, you know, trying to convince friends of friends to, to come on. And, and as you said, you know, it's helpful if people have that particular type of personality, you know, or essentially have, have that sort of inbuilt trust with you. That it may not make a lot of sense now, but at least I kind of trust Sam and, and it makes sense to kind of jump in. It's, it's a lot hard to kind of translate that into, uh, into customers. And, um, you know, especially for a product like Casada, which is, you know, focused on security, which as an industry, I, I imagine is quite, you know, skeptical by nature. You've got a couple of sort of 19 year olds 
um, you know, pitching to you about what about the product that they're building. You know, I, I imagine there's a lot of barriers for you to kind of onboard customers, but you managed to get a company like Sportsbet as your first customer on board. And, you know, I know that you're not public about the, the customers that you have using your product, but from what I've heard from uh, a couple of your investors, you know, you've got a number of Fortune 50 companies that are, that are using Casada as well. But just kind of going back to the to the start, you know, how do you convince your, your first customer to, to come on board and, and to really believe in you? Yeah, it was, so one of the things I think we, we did well, uh, not that it was intentional at the time, I guess it kind of was, was we were just, a pain in the ass to a lot of people. So I put so much effort into making sure that everyone I had ever worked with knew exactly what it was we were doing. Uh, and, and, you know, I did that for the first like nine months while we were building the product, even before it existed. And then one day got a, had breakfast with um, a guy, Craig Searle, who was a uh, founder of a company called Hive Engine. I'd worked for him in the past and he told him what I was doing. He goes, actually, yeah, we know someone who may have a need right now. Uh, you know, let me, let me get back to you. And the next day, Dick Ward, champion from Sportsvet, uh, sends me an email. Hey, I've been told to reach out to you. Uh, and look, the crux of it was they had a problem that they'd not been able to solve. And, you know, right, right place, right time. We got very lucky and we're given the opportunity to try and solve it for them. And we did. And that was the, the hardest customer to get, hands down. Like that first one, not, everything broke. None of us knew what we were doing. It was like, holy crap, this is... This is the test and we're testing it with someone like Sportsbet, right? Like one of you know, one of the biggest brands in gaming in Australia. And, you know, trial by fire, we came out the other side, you know, scarred emotionally from the stress of that one. Uh, but that that proof point was then unbelievable. And, and because what we've also found as well is like the buyers of, at least in the enterprise space, of security, for our software, like security software early on, are going to be similar to the people you hire early on in that they are you know, more likely to take risks, they're far more passionate about what they do versus just sort of doing it because it's a job. And that means as long as that we do a good job for them, they're amazing advocates and they're happy to be. And so that's like sports bet, like truly, and I've told them this many, many times, was transformational for us. Like that was, it was unbelievable um, to, to land them and then you know it makes conversations with you know i think i won't actually send it because i'm not sure who's on our website and who's not but you know other big enterprises to sort of follow suit and oh sports bet use you or oh, x use you okay you know we'll, we'll give you a bit you know a bit more leeway and com- complementary to that were the investors we took on so after we closed sports bet and a few others is when we ended up doing our first seed round of funding and um, so that was with reinventure and our innovation fund and it was amazing the difference in conversation and the resistance that vanished when all of a sudden a bank had invested. Um, so that was that was something else which worked really well. But mate, it's yeah, it's hard. I think mean, finding someone with a problem that you can solve that they can't solve, like literally, that was that was us. We just put so much effort into being everywhere all at once, and eventually, you know, the the seed popped out of the ground. Yeah, I I do want to sort of come back to your investor base, but kind of diving in a little bit deeper into sort of enterprise sales in particular. I I think that your sort of point in terms of the personalities of people uh, within those companies um, is like at at those early stages that are willing to take a risk is very similar to the type of people that will join you is such a um, such a good point. Uh, you know, the number of conversations that I've had with uh, with founders that are speaking to enterprises, but it just is on an endless loop and kind of goes nowhere, um, is it, kind of a little bit endless. From your experience, any advice for founders who are looking to, to sell into enterprises in terms of ways that they can make sure that they're either speaking to the right people or help them sort of further identify whether, you know, this particular prospect is something that, that they should devote more time and resources towards or whether they, they should sort of move on to another lead? Yeah, history from buying from others, history of buying, sorry, from other startups, I think is a really big one. That's, we've asked, if you, and sometimes it's public, sometimes you need to ask, but if they have a track record of doing it, it probably bodes well for you. Uh, it says a lot about, you know, the procurement team, the, the people in the business. Another one is actually the culture of the business. That's what we found. Like if you look at Sportsbet and a bunch of our other early customers, they were all more like modern tech businesses, right? Who have an appetite for a bit more risk to solve a problem that needs solving. So th- those two things can be good leading indicators. Then what we've, you know, 
also found, I guess, is like stack ranking the problem, right? If if the problem's not in the person's top three, it's probably not going to be solved that year. That's that's the, the sort of rule of thumb we've found. Uh, and and most people will be really open with that, you know, when when you ask, just like make sure is it actually a priority solve or is it you know something you just like to. Um, yeah, and and finally, honestly, like the personality of the champion and, and who you're working with, like that that truly again makes makes night and day. And I know a lot of it's a bit wishy washy. It's yeah, I wish there were more like science to it. And I think as you get bigger, there is, but in the early days, like so much of it is sort of gut feel and just trying to understand like what's this business like, what's their reputation, you know, culturally, and then in the market with other startups. Yeah, I think your point in terms of being a priority, having seen it from the other side, from an AWS perspective, you know, you can sort of really understand that, you know, businesses can only kind of do so much and like enterprises at that scale. And so if it's not a priority, the chances of things getting approved is is really, really challenging. Um, again, any any sort of advice on, you know, really kind of teasing that out from from conversations with, with potential leads in terms of, you know, whether... Um, this is actually in pri- a priority area for them or not? Yeah, a, a good one is what, what we found useful is actually to use their, un- their understanding of the problem as a gauge as to how well, of how much they actually want to solve it, right? So we had plenty of conversations where people were like, yeah, bots are bad. And we'd sort of be like, oh, well, what do they do for you? Oh, you know, they're just on our website. Okay, all right. You know, you probably don't actually... You've not invested the time to understand the problem. Therefore, you're probably not worthy, ready to solve it. I think that, at least in the security space, is, is a real big one. And then also their awareness of the, the like, industry you're in, right? So if we you know, come in and they ask about you know, a competitor and you know, good questions or good questions about general trends in the bot space, you know, that, that also is probably a good signal that they're actually, they're genuine in it, they want to solve it. Yeah, that's we've just found there's a lot of people, you know, Oh, so it's, it's a problem, sure, and th- that's that's where their understanding ends, and that's a bad bad indicator for us. And you know, obviously, you sort of you mentioned you know good luck and timing uh, in terms of landing sports better as a customer from you know relationships that you already had. I think you know one of the one of the the really sort of challenging periods of time for for a startup is kind of when they feel like they've exhausted their networks in terms of you know landing potential leads and those sorts of things they might have you know in your example of, of landing like a, a sports bet as, as a customer what does that next phase look like in terms of sort of trying to expand out from um you know i guess their own personal networks when they've got some potential case studies in place how do they sort of move to the next layer of you know potential companies or potential leads for that for them to bring on board as customers yeah, so definitely twofold. I, I can't remember who it was uh, that said to me very early on, it's never your network, it's your network's net worth. And so getting, and that, that obviously rang, rang true for us. And so getting good at leveraging the folk that you know I had known directly or some of the others had, had known directly was, was key for us. Next, it was then the, the next few hires, right? So after that, our first hire was a former... Uh, technical sales rep from our biggest competitor locally, um, Akamai. And, you know, we, we sort of realized, okay, this guy firstly knows all the customers we could ever want, understands the space. And that's just, first of all, it's going to legitimize us. Uh, and then, you know, open us up to a lot of conversations thanks to his previous relationships. So that's, we made that investment. Uh, we brought him on board. He's been with us since, Nick Rennitz, amazing guy. And that's where things started to pick up because what we found is like once we had sort of like six or seven good enterprise customers is when at least in Australia we slowly started to get the referral effect where it was oh yeah you know the buddy's having a beer yeah we use Kasadi you should chat to them and and we started to become known at least in like the security communities which was incredible uh, the other side was then like just doing more and more events like it's it you know it's not rocket science we pitched at bloody every single event we could get to we we got some insane logos from like some startup pitch events that we did it's actually absurd uh and you know like speaking to amazon events like that literally that just brand awareness brand awareness you know all of a sudden once you're once one person trusts you enough to like buy you or and a few more do it's it's incredible how much it changes and how many people are interested in all of a sudden chatting to solve the problem 
yeah, a lot of it is, you know, as you said, being right place, right time. But I think it's also kind of how do you put yourself in a situation where you get, you know, create the opportunity for those types of situations to happen. So like I said, leveraging networks, putting yourself out there in terms of events and things like that uh, as well is, is really, really interesting. I guess, you know, you know, one thing that you sort of mentioned was uh, the investors that you've brought on. And I love how strategically you sort of think about, you know, even your hiring process in terms of, you know, who are the types of people that we need to both give us credibility, but then also open up additional doors for you. Uh, and obviously you touched on our innovation fund and David Shane, who I've had on the podcast a couple of times and Malcolm Turnbull as well who obviously, aside from being a a prime, you know, former prime minister of Australia is also a very active investor and and obviously very deeply interested in in cybersecurity. I had fascinating conversations with them in in the lead up to this interview, but uh, really curious to know from your perspective, what was it like in terms of initially bringing on our innovation fund and someone like Malcolm Turnbull onto your cap table? Yeah, so we we brought them on at very different times in in the business. Um, I remember the very first time that I met Dave was OAF's old offices, uh, sat down with this guy that like we'd been introduced you know to by someone, um, in f- flowers on his shirt, sleeves rolled up, sits down you know big Safa greeting, uh, and immediately knew that this was someone I wanted to work with, like just yeah that was that was the experience from day one, uh, and it's it's still the experience today. Like I I truly I'm not trying to be a sales rep for for those guys, but. They have been unbelievable to work with. And what was incredible too, like that was the, we'd not raised like money from people like that before. And so that was unbelievably validating and confidence boosting to us. Where it's like, hey, these like actual professional investors think we're a decent enough bet, you know? At the time it was like 2 million Aussie bucks. That's, hey, that was more money than I'd ever seen in a bank account at once. Um, and, and that was unreal. And so obviously they came in with, with reInventure um, Westpac's group, and it was a similar situation with with Danny, where first of all, reinventure unbelievably strategic because of the basically the association with Westpac, um, but also just such good people, and we all kind of shared, I guess, similar views of of the world as a potential like what we were doing, and that that definitely helped a lot. Then, Mr. Turnbull, I thought it was a joke when we got a reach out. I was like, this is fishing. Something something's wrong here. And it wasn't. And I think I grinned like a maniac the first time that I like met him. And he, yeah, he was probably worried I was gonna like do something weird. Uh, and I probably did. But he as well has been, yeah. I, I, again, I couldn't say enough good things. So he's so active, and the the mentoring that both he and David have have given me, like, there's no way we, like, at least I personally would be here without them. And. That's something that I'm super, super proud of is like the board and the investors we put together are unbelievable. Like it just, they're so supportive. They're such good people. And, you know, they also want to help build something amazing, which I know I've just heard some, some horror stories. So I'm very happy that we've put together a bunch of, of awesome, awesome folk. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously, I've, I've had David on the podcast a few times before. I've had Malcolm on the uh, on the podcast as well, and I believe I've had Simon Cat from Reinventure many years ago. But um, one thing that David mentioned in my conversation with him as well was, you know, uh, and he spoke about this on the podcast as well that he's very much a gut feel investor, and he knows kind of very quickly whether he's going to sort of work with someone or not. And he said within five minutes he knew that you were someone that that he wanted to sort of invest in and, and really get behind as well. But I guess, as you mentioned, you know, getting that initial sort of $2 million check from Green Venture and our innovation fund was the first time that you had sort of engaged with investors and, and wanted to uh, bring them on board. I guess what sort of led to the decision to kind of raise capital for, um, for Casada at that time? And, and again, what did that process look like in terms of bringing on your, your first few investors? Yeah, so, so we, our run rate before we started working with them was a few hundred grand a year. So it wasn't a whole lot. It was enough to support you know, five 19 year olds and a, and a 35 year old at the time. Um, the, the decision for us was very much around how big is the opportunity? How fast do we want to go? And what are the blockers? So the, honestly, like the, the legitimization of us in just the market, having raised a bit of money was a really big thing. Um, so that, that played a lot. Sorry, there's some motorbikes going past. 
um, that that played a lot into our decision. It's like we we first of all we need legitimization. We need experience around the table with people who've done it because none of us ever had built you know a tech business before. Um, then it was about all right, who's the right sort of person to work with, and yeah, David and his his gut feel pieces definitely rubbed off on me uh, a lot, and I thoroughly love using using gut feel now it's, it's one of those those things you just sort of know and unfortunately if you if you get it it's hard to shake <laughs> um <laughs> good or bad and you know finding the guys at oef particularly with david's experience with comtech was huge and then danny at reinventure uh, actually funny enough his work with data republic was a big thing for us and that's where we were very aligned because you know one of the things we like to help people do is secure their data um, yeah, and, and look, that was months though of pitching. I have to say, like we, from first conversation, we would have met the OIF and reinventure guys middle of 2016, first chat ever. The round closed early 2017, I want to say March. Um, so it was a hell of a process of just like keeping them up to date, what's going on in the business, here are the wins, here's what we're doing, here's what we're struggling, and you know, sort of, can we get some help and advice? Yeah, and then just getting to know us. Uh, I have to say it was probably the hardest round of funding we raised by a significant margin. It took the longest, that's for sure. How long did that process take? Uh, I want to say nine months from first conversation to, to money in the bank. Yeah, I, I guess is is a fairly sort of common experience for, for a lot of founders as well. I think things are starting to change slightly with, with sort of more capital um, being available in, in the market now. But you know, again, sort of going back to, to one of the things that you mentioned in terms of being, you know, really thoughtful in terms of the, the type of partners that you sort of brought on board onto your cap table. And, you know, again, there's, there's so much conversation and I think a lot of the focus tends to be on how do we raise $2 million and how do we do it as sort of quickly as possible and like who is going to be willing to give us money. Uh, and there is so much focus on, you know, the due diligence that VCs do into companies. Uh, and again, not enough on, you know, founders doing their own DD on, you know, are these the right investors for us to, to really sort of partner with long term? You know, and you kind of mentioned this about Dave. I think anyone that's that's met or spoken to, to David will want to work with him uh, almost immediately. But for the benefit of founders that are currently going through a fundraising process, do you have any advice on, you know, what are ways that they can potentially vet their um, their VCs or their or their investors that they're speaking to? I'd speak to other founders. This is the first one. Um, that's what I I put in a lot of effort to go and speak to founders that I was both introduced to by them and then also not introduced to by them, um, and that 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 told me what I needed to know for both of them very quickly. Um, when the message was consistent for people, even if they had not been you know warm intro to me, uh, that was honestly the best one, and that sort of you know that I guess came last. Reputation in the market and that you know I guess that's the first filter. But yeah, seriously, speaking to other people was, was unreal. And something else that has been really valuable for us is that everyone on our board has built a business. Everyone. Uh, we, we, we do not have someone that sits on our board that has not actually started and built the company themselves. And so the, I want to say like the founder empathy that almost creates, because it is such a unique journey, right? Like it's horrible sometimes, absolutely horrible. And it's, you know, very isolating and, and a lot, not a lot of people get to, thankfully, I think for a lot of people, experience it. And so, you know, us having, you know, literally everyone on the board having built a business, is, is that I think is something that's very, very important. Um, there's a lot of people who give advice, but I think, you know, those who've dug the trenches and understand that the advice tends to be a little different. Absolutely. I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. And, you know, the, essentially this podcast has been built on the same philosophy as well of, you know, how do you make sure that you're sort of taking advice from people that have been there and done it, knowing that not everything will be applicable, but at least it's, you know, hearing from someone that's that's been there and can kind of talk about what's happened versus theoretically um, what they may or may not do in, in particular situations. Absolutely. I'm, I'm, I don't know about you. I, I, what I found, though, I've got a few friends who are, you know, founders of businesses that are a bit further along. So many of the problems are really the same. They just maybe manifest in slightly different ways, but at their core, it's like it's usually, you know, people problems, uh, scaling problems, oper operational problems. That's, yeah, that's where I think most of the headaches seem to come from once you get past that first, you know, product market fit stage. Absolutely. Um, you know, speaking of commonalities, um, you know, speaking to both Malcolm Turnbull and David Shane, you know, both of them mentioned that 
uh, you know, you have all of the traits that they would look for in founders. Uh, the quote that I have from Malcolm is, you know, he has all the traits that you'd want as a founder. He's very creative. He's a good leader. He's a good team builder. He doesn't think he and he alone has all of the answers. And he's very respectful of his colleagues uh, and very considered in the way that he approaches building the company. You know, obviously, I, I'm sure from your perspective, really nice to kind of hear those words. But, you know, we were speaking about this before we turned on the microphone. You know, like a founder journey is, is really, really hard. And, and there are a lot of times that you sort of question yourself and, and question kind of that, that process. What does that sort of look like for you personally um, in terms of your own journey, especially, you know, as a 19 year old starting the company? Yeah. So early on, it was OK, bec- like very early on, I mean, like maybe the first year or so, just because we were building a product like that was the part that I knew and loved trying to sell like it was all about organized chaos in every single possible way that you can have it. Where it started to get more difficult is when we raised that first bit of money. And it was almost like all of a sudden it became real. And we started bringing on some more people and it was even more outside of what I'd experienced. Like at that point, like I'd never managed another person ever. I'd never even like, I'd had one manager at like Macquarie Bank and that was it. That was like my whole experience with like people management. And like, yeah, managing finances, understanding all of those concepts. And what I found is that the the doubts in my head about my ability to do this just like kept getting worse and worse as we got, as we just kept growing, we raised our A round, um, which I wanna say was like 5 million bucks or so. Uh, and yeah, it just sort of kept compiling, right? We We had a very flat org structure. We tried to like, you know, make it a bit more tiered just for like some management so that people, you know, had some, you know, others to report into, but, you know, really it was structureless and uh, that caused a lot of issues for me because I didn't understand like, what should the structure be? Like, you know, am I the right person? And I found myself like very much like retreating and going inside myself, being a bit more disengaged in situations where I was just like, I really don't know what to do or how to do this. So that was, that was my reaction. It was probably a, a, a bad one, but that's what I did. I just sort of switched off and then, you know, sort of closed in on myself. And then ahead of our sort of first US funding round, we had the opportunity to, we had an awesome experienced sales leader and I wholeheartedly thought that I was not the right person to be leading the business. I thought I don't know enough, you know, people don't want to, you know, come and work with me and, you know, there needs to be a, a real adult at the table. Uh, and so made the decision to have someone else come in and lead the business. Yeah, a leadership, a leadership team started to get formed um, while they were here. And that the impact on me and the business was actually even worse. And that was pretty horrible. There were, you know, it was obviously combined with COVID because that's, I lived over in the US, uh, went through a very, very miserable time, both, you know, with isolation there and um, yeah, everything going on at, work and just sort of seeing the impact that me not leading the business was having. And that was something I had so incredibly misjudged uh, was that. And was again, thankful to have an, an unreal board. Yeah, Malcolm and David helped a lot of, a lot of very sad phone calls with them. Uh, and we decided to, to make the change back relatively, relatively quickly put in place an actual leadership team so that, you know, I have no idea about running a customer support and success organization. I don't need to, we have Simone, you know, I don't know how to, you know, manage an engineering team. We don't, I don't need to, we have, you know, David Turner. And so the difference that made for me and then combined with just what I'd seen where someone, you know, who had a lot of experience just wasn't the right person to lead them, helped me immensely. And then I also got a CEO coach, which was very, very helpful as well. But it, it's been, yeah, it's been a really rough journey. Like it just, it kept getting worse and worse and worse, I found. And, you know, people could tell me that they thought I was a good leader. I didn't believe them. Like, sure, I may look like it. I have no idea what I'm doing. You know, I have no legitimate reason to be here. And yeah, that was the, that was, that was the fun journey that I've been on. <laughs> Well, first of all, Sam, thank you for being so open about about your kind of experience and, and journey with um, with Casada as well. Like, I, I think that you know, it's 
the way that you described how you were feeling is something that like, I know that I felt myself when I was running stage label, it's something that, you know, privately I've spoken to a lot of other founders about, um, many guests on the podcast who have built very successful companies as well, as well, have kind of felt very, very similar things. So it's definitely not, um, and, and I think, you know, part of this process is that a founder journey can be very lonely and, you know, you don't, uh, there isn't necessarily a, a playbook and there isn't any way that you can go to kind of understand what it's like to suddenly manage a hundred plus people um, and things like that w- without kind of having that sort of experience. And a lot of the time you just kind of, you know, feel like you're just the worst founder because you should know a lot better and everyone else seems to, you know, be building incredible businesses and things inside are kind of on flames and, and all of that as well. So first of all, thank you for being really open. And, and I think, you know, from you know my conversations with both Malcolm and David, they they also sort of touched on the negative impacts of of you sort of pulling away, both in terms of results, but they also just mentioned. I, I know David mentioned that, you know, your kind of personality almost changed. He said that in in board meetings, you know, from going from someone who was really sort of enthusiastic and energetic, you know, you really sort of pulled back and and weren't as engaged and. Um, like all of this was having a really detrimental impact on the company as a whole and they needed you to come back and for you to sort of um, step back on on board. Like you said, it it was kind of important for you as well to kind of see what it was like when you weren't um, specifically running the company and you've kind of touched on, you know, getting founder coaches and and all of those sort of things again. Uh, Again, for, for, I guess, like founders that are a little bit earlier in the journey and, you know, maybe don't have all of those sort of resources in place or don't have a formal board set up, do you have any advice on how founders can either upskill themselves or, um, you know, create the right sort of environment and structure around them to, to get them the support that they need? Yeah, I, two things that have been unbelievably helpful for me, uh, firstly, relationships with other founders. Like it is just that, and they, they can be at, at the sort of stage of business, but ideally they're a few years ahead. That's, that's been very, very valuable. Um, and then I guess the other side of it is, you know, obviously resources are really tight at the start and it, it's, yeah, you are trying to juggle like a hundred balls at once and you've never been taught how to juggle. So, you know, picking, picking the right battles, I'd say is, is really important. Like what, okay, sure. If you can, you know, 99 of the balls can smash, which one can't, you know, that should be the one you focus on and slowly bring in people, um, who, you know, can, off you know take things off like that's one thing that i really didn't even need to understand that i had to do which was build out an lt and it is hard like early on you know you are not going to have the resources for super experienced people but you know bringing on board folk who can grow into those roles and just you know take things off you's been it has been you know very at least important for me what our cfo got me to do when uh well just actually ahead of all this change he was like map out your role what do you like what are you good at and you know what makes you happy what do you not like and you know what do you suck at and that was literally kind of the hiring diagram okay here are the four things that i really like and i'm really good at and add value with everything else over here i'm not good okay what's what's the most important to get correct out of these things let's hire someone to do that and then sort of work our way down the list wow that's that's amazing advice and you know again i I sort of love your point around getting a founder coach as well i think it's something that nick crocker from blackbird has previously mentioned on this podcast as well you know in the same way that elite athletes um still have coaches to you know help them why don't founders kind of think about the the same thing as well um i I know that again this is a very sort of personal uh, relationship that you would have with your founder coach but are you able to share some of the systems or processes or kind of thinking that your founder coaches has helped you with? Yeah, so what I found super, I love facts and data. Like that's, you know, help me make better decisions, help me understand where, you know, where I'm not going well. And what I found super, super useful is they interviewed everyone around me. They interviewed everyone on the leadership team, everyone on the board, and, you know, in a beautiful report, here are the things people think you're good at, and here are the things people think you're not as good at, and you, you know, need, need to improve. Here are the top three things to improve on. Like literally that exercise was actually the most valuable thing we did. And then just, you know, every few weeks meeting going, all right, how are you tracking them? I suck at having very direct conversations that make me uncomfortable. Like that was one of the biggest things I had to work on. And, you know, it was called out in all these, you know, these, uh, I guess, interviews that they did, you know, the biggest impact positively for Sam would be if he could have more direct conversations easier. And so literally just again like being laser focused like how what behaviors need to change to have the biggest impact on everyone at the business 
that that's what I really needed out of the founder coach, like where it was that you know commercial relationship, um, and that's I found so unbelievably valuable. Out of other founders, where it's more of just like an informal mentoring piece, like just monthly catch ups, you know, where it's like like what's on your mind, you know, what. I literally there's one the guy who runs Secure Code Warrior Peter Dunn here is unbelievable and he's you know one of them for me big shout out to him. Uh, every time I go hey mate I got this problem he goes oh we had that problem two years ago. Here's how it manifests and then he said and this is the next problem you're gonna run into and like you know literally every time he's been correct. So the, I guess the combo of those two sorts of people to guide you one very much from a here and now this is what you you know as as a leader need to to do or not do and then also you know for the business itself have just been a great, great combo. Finding, you know, two in one would be unbelievable as well. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic advice. Sam, final thing that I wanted to touch on you on, uh, which kind of like least, loosely sort of spoken about is, um, you know, building building a company and specifically in terms of, you know, building the, the right sort of company structure. On the podcast, we, we've spoken a little bit about how you know, you start off with building generalists, but at a, a specific point, you need to sort of focus on hiring specialists in. Um, you've also touched on, you know, the importance of having uh, and building out that sort of leadership team around you to kind of help support the, the founder as well. You know, I, again, for, for anyone who potentially hasn't gone that through that process before, but is considering that, you know, when is the right time and, and what does that structure look like in terms of, um, you know, building that out in the right way and sort of transitioning the, the company? Yeah, so... We, I want to say we ran into our first like structural problems. It's like 15 people. Uh, and that's when we started to need team leads. So that was, that was the first change we made where it was like, okay, now there's just not a group, a blob of people. There's like, you know, a leader for say engineering. For us, there were, one, one thing I want to caveat this with is I, I really think every business can be successful with different structures based on the leaders. So uh, like for, for example, like Simone who runs our customer success and support, she also runs all of our like internal people and culture stuff, right? Maybe not a role that always goes to, or the two, I guess, roles that don't go together, but like she's just the perfect person. And so we've had a few situations like that where, you know, at the start we're like, okay, we'll hire X and Y and then realize actually we have the right person to do both. So I think that is very important to recognize is there are going to be some cases where one person actually can lead two parts of an organization. As long as they're like somewhat aligned, uh, not at odds with each other, maybe not finance and engineering or something else like that. But we, we've very much done it on a proactive like where are our problems going to be basis so once we hit sort of like 15 16 in engineering we realize okay we need a head of engineering um but then before even building out a customer success and support organization properly you know we knew we had to actually build this across the region and we realized we actually didn't even have the talents in-house to like get it to a point where it was a minimum viable product of customer support and so that's like that's where we, we brought in simone so it's it's been a bit of a balancing act of understanding you know where we're just going to have no hope at building that part of the business out versus where we can get it to a point where it's ready for a leader if that makes sense yeah like our look our full lt is almost built out now but like it was it was pretty fleshed out by the time we were 50 55 people you know sort of we started building it out i want to say yeah at about 20 was the first like lt higher and then sort of slowly staggered it over the next you know 30 people and when you're sort of hiring for the leadership team or you know hiring for specialists rather than generalists are there different things that you sort of look for or does the hiring process change for you at all or is it kind of fairly consistent from the early days i uh, it's pretty consistent uh like the first thing is like are they a culture ad like one of the things i love to think about you know at the lt layer at any team layer it's like if this person was sitting in a meeting right now with our LT, with whatever team they're joining, would the people around them think, wow, this person adds value? Or like, and do I want to be around this person? Um, if they don't pass that litmus test, it's not gonna, it's not gonna work. Um, and you know, after that, then it is kind of hard, right? Especially if you know you don't know enough about the area you're hiring for to figure out, you know, what they what they do and they don't know. And I guess part of that's a bit of gut feel, right? You know. If you understand enough about it, do they seem to talk the talk? Um, 
And, you know, do you feel like you're going to enjoy working with them? Are they, you know, going to be open to learning? But uh, truly the most important thing is, is like, if they're around the rest of the team they join in, are the other people in that team going to think, wow, this is, I'm glad this person's at the table. And still a, a healthy amount of gut feel through that hiring process. Yeah, healthy amount of gut feel. <laughs> I, and I think that's so much of it, right? Like everyone's, there's going to be a company for everyone, you know, no matter the sort of personality they have and, and the way they like to operate. And it just, you know, if they're not for you, they're not for you. If you're not for them, you know, you're not for them. That's all right. There's a lot of people in this world. I think the it's so it's so important to get that right, especially at the leadership layer. Uh, again, another fun lesson, you know, for, for myself and I think the businesses is the impact. Like if you don't get an LT hire right, like it just flows down through the whole company. Um, and yeah. Yeah, I, I guess, um, you know, speaking of that, everyone kind of, you know, talks about the... Uh, you know, the importance of hiring the, the right people and, and the importance of that process. And, um, you know, a, a lot of the time, you know, you hope that kind of through that process, you, you're bringing on the right people. I don't know if you've necessarily, um, you know, had a bad experience of doing that, but are there sort of structures that you put in, um, you know, in case if the hires that you've made haven't quite worked out in terms of making sure that you sort of identify those quickly and, and can sort of take action on that? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I think onboarding is a really important part of that. And, you know, onboarding done right sets expectations for everyone. Um, that's all we found. So, you know, have a very real 30 day, 60 day, 90 day, 180 day plan and make sure that's actually reviewed and you then, you know, then you avoid surprises if for whatever reason things aren't going well. I think that's been, that's, and not to say we've done it perfectly all the time, but where we have done it right has been very, very valuable because there's just, there's no room for interpretation. Um, and, you know, I, I, I'm definitely one of those people that when expectations are set, it makes it easier. On that note, Sam, thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on the podcast. And uh, for those people that maybe want to find out more about you, say hello, get in touch, uh, or find out more about Casada, what's the best way for them to do that? Uh, honestly, uh, probably LinkedIn for myself or Casada at casada.io. Perfect. I will make sure all of those links are in the show notes. Sam, once again, thanks for coming on the show. Mate, appreciate the invite. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to episode 160 of the Startup Playbook podcast. As always, full show notes from this interview will be available at startupplaybook.co. I'll be back next week with another episode. But in the meantime, if you enjoyed this interview, please don't forget to like, share and subscribe. As always, thank you for tuning in and I'll see you next week.